Okay, hi everyone. Welcome. Welcome to Laser Talk. All right, it's Tuesday and another week begins. Um, since Dr. Young's program that I did, I think two Saturdays ago, I have been thinking about doing a psychological analysis for the Chinese leader Xi Jinping. And then I found um, a psychiatrist who actually did a talk not too long ago, I think maybe two weeks ago. And I, I watched this video and, and then I started looking. Um, I tried to find you know, because he he talked he talked about Xi Jinping's earlier life. You know how how he suffered from trauma and how that um, you know become becomes who he is today. So I started looking to see what I can find about Xi Jinping's childhood, and I found this great interview he gave about twenty years ago. So I spent a lot of time translating his interview, and um, I I try to condense it and came up with four clips that I will share with you. And also, I will also, I'm sorry, I will also share with you um, this doctor's uh, talk, part of his talk as well. So um, U.S. intelligence agency have a long history of studying foreign leaders. The first person they studied was Adolf, um, Adolf Hitler. And the researchers correctly predicted that Hitler would commit suicide after suffering a certain defeat. And Dr. Enrico Suardi, I think I think I'm pronoun I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Here I have a picture of him. There he is. Um, he's a psychiatrist serving in the US State Department. And he believes that conducting psychoanalysis on political leaders can help nations achieve geopolitical goals effectively because interactions at the highest level of government is the interactions between individuals. And his talk on Xi Jinping was um, uh, from a, a qualitative analysis. It's called psychobiographical profiling. Um, and I think he, he, he gave the talk at the Institute of World Politics. Uh, it's an hour long speech, um, but the main point is he said, to understand who Xi Jinping is, we must examine um, the trauma he suffered early in life. And this mostly refers to his experience during the Cultural Revolution. Um, I went to look for the information, uh, and he gave an interview in 2004. He gave a very detailed description of his, of his experience during that time. Um, and I think this is the basis of Dr. Uh, Swadi's work. Of course, I'm not a psychiatrist nor a uh, psychologist. Um, I'm just following his framework and presenting you more details about his um, about Xi Jinping's inf uh, formative years, including what the doctor called his trauma. I have five clips of videos to play. Um, four from Xi Jinping and one from the doctor. I know some of you are not fans of um, the Chinese leader or Chinese leaders in general, me neither. Uh, I'm playing his videos for the sole purpose of understanding his motivation, character, and beliefs. Um, we need to remain objective and in order to understand the opponent and, and our subject. So I'm not in any way, you know, glorifying him by playing his interview here. Okay, so let's talk first talk about his early life. Um, hi, hi everyone. Okay, great. Um, let me let me make this a bigger. So here's Xi Jinping's parents with him. Uh, I don't know how he was in that picture, but the, the, that was his. Um, so his father, Xi Zhongxun, had been China's vice premier from, I think, 1950, I don't remember the exact year, maybe around 55 or 54, until 1962, when he was accused by Mao of being involved in an anti-CCP novel. Um, Xi Jinping was nine years old and at the time, and his family still lived a privileged life while his father was investigated at the Central Party School. Three years later, in 1965, his father was sent to work at a machinery factory um, in Shanxi province. So I have, I think I have more pictures. Yeah, so this this is um, him and his brother. I think Xi Jinping is the older son here uh, with the father. 
I actually have a family picture. I think all four kids. And his father also has three children from uh, his first marriage. So this is um, his second wife and, and four kids. Um, so his father was, yeah, was sent to, he basically was demoted from vice premier to uh, to a factory, a deputy director at a factory. Now, after the Cultural Revolution started in 1966, like many high-ranking government officials, uh, his family, she's family, lost their privilege, and they were the, the home was ransacked, and they moved out of their courtyard home uh, to the public housing provided by uh, the party school where her where his mother worked. Now, the Red Guards, let me talk about the Red Guards because that plays a very important role in Xi Jinping's life. The Red Guards in Beijing during the Cultural Revolution were divided. One faction was made up of the children of the high-ranking officials like Xi Jinping. Um, these people felt threatened after their parents lost power. So they got organized and staged violent protests um, including ransacking government offices. And these privileged youth believe that they are the legitimate uh, heir to power, to CCP power. And they shouted slogans against Madame Mao and against Cultural Revolution. Um, so it's very interesting. They actively participated in the Cultural Revolution uh, which was created, you know, initiated by Mao, but were against Mao and the movement itself. Um, so they were merely they merely used the movement to get their messages across. Uh, but some of their activities were quite violent. Uh, the other faction of the Red Guards were the young people from ordinary families. So the the factions got into um, violent fights. Now. Xi Jinping during that time got into those um, those fights because he belonged to the uh, you know the faction made up of primarily high high official children's um, children of high ranking officials, and uh, so here's a picture of his father who during the Cultural Revolution you know he was handing a banner that has his name on it and says you know. Uh, anti CCP, uh, you know, and his name. Um, so this guy, th this is a. If you're familiar with Chinese, uh, if you're a fan of Go, this is um, Nie Weiping, a famous Nine Dan Go player, and he went to school with Xi Jinping. He detailed one f incident um, years later. Um, he was close to Xi Jinping and another boy by the name of Liu Weiping because all three boys have, have a, a pin in their name and also because they were all sidelined uh, or bullied at the school because their fathers were considered political troublemakers. So it was 1968 when Xi Jinping was 15 years old. One day they heard that there was a gathering of, of the Red Guards, you know, their faction, so they went. And there were hundreds of them. Suddenly in another faction came, hundreds of them as well, and they rushed in and came after them. And, and the other faction, the, their faction weren't prepared, but the other faction came with sticks and other um weaponries, shall we say. And an ugly fight broke out. And Nie Weiping, this guy that you see on screen, um, and Xi Jinping responded quickly and was able to flee. But the, the other boy was slow and was beaten and suffered a concussion uh, to his head. And decades later, um, no, but here's a picture of Xi Jinping and then Nie Weiping uh, in their younger years. So decades later, Xi Jinping said that if he didn't run fast enough on that day, he wouldn't be where he was then, meaning become a CCP leader. So you see from the age 13 to 16, um, that was Xi, Xi Jinping's formative years, but being bullied at school, fighting and chaos, you know, and, and running uh, for safety, basically were everyday life for him. And according to his biography, he was arrested and detained during that period. 
And after he fled and went home, his mother was afraid to keep him at home and sent him back to the detention center. I don't think it was because she posed any threat to his mother, but it was probably because keeping him at home wasn't a safe thing to do at all. And also um, his mother joined the revolution in her teens. She joined the CCP military at the age of 14. So she uh, might not see the need for her to protect her son at home, you know, um, having joined the revolution herself at the age of 14. So from the very beginning, Xi Jinping has had experience dealing with factional fighting, you see, chaos, and the lack of understanding and support. You see that, you see more of that later in his life. Um, but he has very good survival skills from very, from early on. And this is most evident in his own words, describing how he felt uh, when he left Beijing to join Mao's um, Go to the Countryside movement in 1969, he described what happened on the train with 1,000 other teenagers bidding fa their family farewell uh, before the train departed. Um, he was only 16 years old, but here, let me play the video where he talks, talked about that experience. Okay, let me f make sure I found the right video. Here we go. Um, the Zhuang Lieshan,我记得很清楚那是一九六九年的一月份。全部都哭啊，那整个专列上没有不哭的人，就是我在笑，就是我在笑。哎，当时底底下我那些亲属说：“你你怎么还笑？”我说：“我不走才得哭
，啊，这一屋的同学，看了看老乡来了，聊几句，哎，咱们还没问一个最重要的事儿呢，你是什么出身呢？哎、啊，说贫下中农，这好，行，贫下中农，抽根烟，啊，再突然问到了说，这人说我是，啊，富农，富农，滚蛋，啊，要给轰出去了，啊，呃，见到有人来要饭了，啊，滚蛋，啊，最后给。老百姓就说：“哎呀，这些学生啊，残酷着嘞，啊，啊，说是待人不好。当然我们说不对呀，这都是富农啊，我们对他好了，不就是对人民群众的不好吗？啊，很教条啊，没有见过实际中的事儿。因为我不是漫无目的啊去，而且也比较自由散漫，所以基本上我不太听招呼的。刚去了以后，什么上班、上工、干活，我是不去的。”其他同学都是很很很规矩，我是不去的。去了以后，爬到山上，我累的就气喘吁吁了，我不干活了。哎，那种劳动强度是使我感到震撼，啊，就是说这个到吃中午饭，早饭到吃中午饭，中间就有可以一次休息，就是抽一袋烟。当然不成文的规定就是说，如果你烟瘾上来了，可以坐在旁边抽一袋烟，哎。所以是，所以甚至可以说，我们抽烟就是这么学会的，老想去偷懒儿。Okay, so you see the privileged youth,、um, you know, finding,、uh, trying to survive, right, in a, in a place. Actually,、um, the 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 situation is worse than than. You know what's described in the video because the biggest challenge at the time was food.、Um, the the village chief was trying to divide the girls because they they had fifteen they had fifteen students, four girls. So team one had nine students, four girls and five guys, and then his team had nine boys. And then the the village chief was trying to move some girls to. To this team, because the girls, he his reason is the girls can help them cook food, and then the six guys said we don't need girls to cook, we can cook ourselves. But it turned out、um, it was just very difficult for them to cook、um, food because they have the biggest challenge is to find、um, uh, fire firewood. Um, they it was easy for them to find dry leaves, but the leaves burn very quickly, and then the food was still not cooked.、Um, they would have to find the right wood. You know, they have to go, you know, climb trees and cut tree tr branches, and then and make you know firewood, which these、um, kids from Beijing had no idea what to do. So they couldn't.、Uh, they had such a hard time, you know, trying to feed themselves.、Um, but anyways. So, you see how it, it's. I thought it's very interesting how you know these urban youth go to the countryside and basically have. You know, they've been brainwashed. They think the rich peasants are bad; that they need to be kicked out, and beggars、uh, were bad; they need to be kicked out. But then、um, they learn later that the. The so-called rich peasants weren't rich at all. The only reason they were labeled rich peasants were because they raise、um, instead of working in the farm on, 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 in the field, they raise lambs. So they had like dozens of lambs to raise, and so they got the the social label rich peasants. But they are about the same as everyone else in terms of、uh, wealth. And then、um, the students thought the beggars were bombs and. But the peasants explained to them that every family went out to beg for food,、uh, because there was a saying: January rich, February poor, March and April they barely survive. So from February to、uh, April, there wasn't enough food for everyone in the village. So the women、um, took the children and go out beg for food, and left the food for men、um, who worked in the field. So every family go out to beg food. So I thought this is、um, the first time that Xi Jinping discovered that the reality was different from the propaganda、uh, in Beijing. And as much as the CCP were trying to, you know, separate people from class, from social class to social class, but the Chinese peasants at the time didn't really see much of a difference. 
Um, but that, but the poverty, hard, harsh living condition, and the hard labor was difficult for Xi Jinping. And in, and three months later, in April 1969. Uh, the CCP held the Ninth Party Congress, and Xi Jinping listened carefully to the radio. Uh, and when, and, and he didn't hear his father's name in the Central Committee, and this made him feel hopeless. And he decided to uh, to flee, uh, and he went back to Beijing after three months. And then when he after he went back to Beijing, he he was locked up as a as a drifting. A homeless, or I think his family were all scattered, was sent to edu- uh, labor camps or education camp. They were not home. Nobody was home. Uh, so he stayed in the detention center for six months. And after having nowhere to go, he went to uh, his aunt's home so- somewhere else. And they convinced him to go back to return to Yan'an. So eventually, he, um, against his will, he had no choice but return to the village. And here's his, in his own words, describe um, how he overcame the, the challenge. Uh, 接近了解他们而且客观上呢我也必须得依靠他因为当时我们全村的知识青年全走光了那这叫牛肉马皮了一点那个高亮米的这个团子吃的都很好经过这么一个过程他们这生活观生活观就是什么也不会做什么都要依靠别人后来呢你慢慢什么都学我们也学着捡毛线但是织袜子我还是织不好养毛袜子但是呢这个缝衣服这个缝被子这些活都是自己做
1974, at the age of 20, he, he officially became a member of the Communist Party. He had been denied several multiple times prior because of his father. Um, and then, then he became the party secretary of the village. Basically, he was, a, he was the village leader. And in 1975, he left the village to go to Beijing to attend Tsinghua University as a peasant student. Um, some of the young men in the village walked with him um, for 20, 20 miles, I think, yeah, 20, 20 miles to take a picture. Here's the picture. Um, the, basically, the picture say, you know, they, it's the farewell picture. They walked 20 miles, about 30 kilometers to the town to take this group picture. Um, and he also uh, said, he said there was a, a drawn out farewell um, that made him cry. So here his description about him crying um, in, in the interview. So let me. Oh, here we go. Xiangjing. 找一个地方去这一次那是当中哭了那就是当中丢脸但是我从来我没哭因为这是我人生的一个起承点这个是我人生中的这个逆境中是人生中我最需要各方面帮助的时候而延安人民给我伸出了无私的帮助之手我现在所形成的很多这些基本的观念形成了很多这个基本的特点也是在延安形成的。Okay, so, all right, so now you see uh, his, his in his own words, his in his his own description of what life was was for him um, during the Cultural Revolution, right? So, Xi Jinping and his family were victims of Mao's Cultural Revolution, but they did not seem to have negative opinion or did not hate Mao, because like many young people at the time, Mao's spiritual influence on uh, on them far surpassed um, that of their family, their own family. So by his own admission, he went through some ideological struggles before joining the party. He did question the CCP and the ideology and the ideology it presents. But because he had no alternative, uh, this is my explanation, okay, not not his explanation, because he had no alternative, even when you question, right? Like what Dr. Yang said, um, Stockholm Syndrome, when you are denied access to any other information, um, when the aggressor only give you, you know, their version, the, the only narrative, then you, you have to accept it. So here's his, his, in his Xi Jinping's own words, um, when, when he dis discussed his, doubts. Uh, so this is what he said. He said, in the past, when we talked about faith, um, it's interesting how he equates faith, you know, communism or communist ideology as faith. <laughs> you would never think the association of a, with a political party equates to faith um, in, 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 in the U.S., but yeah, it, in China, it, it, is, it is faith to them. So he said, it seemed like a very vague thing. I think our generation of youth grew up with a resume centering around the excitement of the Red Guard era, which was an emotion and an atmosphere. By the time the ideals of the Cultural Revolution were shattered, it finally became nothingness. 
Later, we read books critically. We went inside and came out, meaning that they 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 went inside into the theory of that the books presented, meaning communist theory, and then came out,、uh, meaning came outside of it to be critical, and eventually felt that only socialism could save China, and the communist ideal was great, and、um, there was no subject. I don't know if it's I or we want it to be. A good communist for life. So that's his own words describing his struggle, and I think it, you know, it's very typical of、um, Chinese from that from that era because they all questioned, you know, Cultural Revolution. They all questioned the CCP, but because of because they have no access to other alternative, particularly、um, like his family. I mean, they were all they're communist leaders, right? So they. They don't. They don't have access to other world views. So, even when they doubt it, they still accept it.、Um, so, Xi Jinping is very proud of this experience in Yan'an because he overcame unimaginable adversity and pulled himself through. But from my perspective, this is his biggest tragedy. Because China as a nation would benefit if Xi Jinping failed in Yan'an miserably as a teenager. Because if Xi Jinping escaped Yan'an and never returned, Yan'an would have stayed on his mind as a miserable memory, a failure, a disaster, a disastrous experience. He would have no good memories of the Cultural Revolution and Mao. Uh, which is realistic and true.、Um, unfortunately, he survived and pulled himself out of the misery.、Um, if, from his perspective, he stood the test, and he think about it, he was the only one who was able to who was able to survive the seven year ordeal out of the fifteen、uh, kids who went with him, and this gave him a great sense of accomplishment、um, and pride. But I mean, psychiatrists may call his experience during Cultural Revolution trauma, but I'm sure he doesn't see it that way. That may be his badge of accomplishment or honor, because he isn't aware, right? He he isn't aware, and he said the Shanxi Plateau gave me faith, and has determined the tra trajectory of my future life. This experience has decided what I would be doing in life, and taught me how to do it. Uh, you certainly see that in in his styles of governing or governance.、Um, so, so who is Xi Jinping?、Um, let me play you a clip. Doctor Enrico Suardi summarized it very well. This is his、um, doctor. This is the doctor's summary. Let me play it. Bad aristocrat. Ho hold on. Let me start from the very beginning. He's a princeling. Is a red aristocrat,、um, a first generation revolutionary. Where his parents? He grew up in an imperial palace,、um, but he was sent down to the yellow earth to be reeducated in the cradle of the revolution. So he lost all that privilege as a as a teen. He outgrew his trauma by identifying with the aggressor. The party. He told the line of the party, ascended methodically to the pinnacle of power thanks to loyalty and apparent malleability. But since then, he has master masterfully consolidated his grip on power. Xi Jinping is a man of ideological faith, is a nationalist, who is determined to ava avenge China's century of trauma and chaos, humiliation. Putting back China at the center of the map in a new era of growth and order, he's a man on a mission,、uh, a transformational leader. He's going to be seventy this year, and legacy matters. Okay.、Um, all right. So that's、um, the doctor's concluding.、Um, 
summary of of um, of the Chinese leader. So what does that mean to geopolitics, right? The Sino-US competition or even Taiwan? Because a lot of people study Xi Jinping and they want to know, they want to understand under what condition will he start a war or might he start a war? And um, and so so here's here's my analysis. I'm not answering when he will start a war or if he will start a war, that's for an, for another um, discussion, right? Because we need to have a separate discussion on Taiwan. But I think from what I presented earlier today from the, from the clips of videos, um, I think we could see that one, Xi Jinping, he is tenacious in nature and very determined and not easily swayed. Um, I don't think he will ever give up the idea of um, unification with Taiwan. And two, at the same time, um, this is something that people don't pay attention to. People always focus on his tenacious nature, um, but I think number two is very important. At the same time, he's very practical and risk averse. He has demonstrated since childhood that he doesn't hesitate to back off when running into a dire situation, right? He 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 fled when um, when he was with his friend, you know, running into the the Red Guard gathering, and then the other side just came with with big sticks, you know, to beat them up, and they they f they fled as fast as they could, even before their their friend was able to. And the second time was he 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 fled, um, yeah, and after three months because he couldn't take it anymore, so. He has, you know, you know, yeah, and, and also the fact that he fled Beijing um, to go to Yan'an. That was also his escape. Um, so, so he has demonstrated that ab that ability um, to step away from from danger. Um, so, I think he's risk averse. Um, I don't think he will launch a war when he isn't sure he can win. Um, number three is he's not a bit intimidated by factional wars or internal chaos or poverty because it has been part of his life since childhood. In fact, um, he might even believe that poverty um, makes people happier because a few years ago he did make the comment, um, I think it was actually last year, wasn't it? But oh, 20, maybe 2021, he said that, you know, when he was in Yang and people were poor, they were really poor, but people were happy and they had a lot of kids. And he said, now people have money, people, you know, live a better life, but people are not happy. They don't, they don't want to have kids. He, he just, so in his mind, you know, he does not like money. He does not. Um, so this, this experience, early experiencing, and uh, made him believe that people could be happy when they are poor, and that's why he's not afraid of poverty. Um, so, yeah. So, and also number four is I think the only thing that can stop him on this dangerous trajectory is when his ideological faith in the CCP collapses. And Dr. Swati suggested that when other heads of state meet him, they should talk about his life in Yan'an. And uh, the doctor didn't explain why, but I think what I can think of is, I think she did, number one, it's a subject that he would like to talk about because he's very proud of his experience then. Um, but I think what people need to make him realize is he didn't differentiate the party, the country, and the people. The CCP and Mao Zedong, you know, sent his life into uh, a dire situation or, 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 or into disaster or sent his family, entire, his entire family into uh, a disaster, a disastrous situation. But it was the Chinese peasants who took care of him in his most helpless days. And despite their own poverty, these Chinese peasants share with him their best food, the best food that they could offer. And the kindness that they displayed was the results 
was the result of the traditional Chinese values um, left behind by Confucius. It's not the result of the CCP's leadership or propaganda. And the reason he could pull himself out of that misery uh, was not because of the success of the party. It was purely because of these kind Chinese peasants um, who, were, who, 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 who still believed in traditional Chinese values. Um, now, you know, because at the time, um, there was no, you know, the people are not subject to that much brainwashing or propaganda because there was no internet, there was no TV, right? So people still lived a relatively quiet life. So even though the Cultural Revolution was vicious, but you could still tell. I, I read a lot of documents um, written about his life during that time. I mean, those peasants were really treating him like their own child. They really took care of him because they felt it was life was, you know, they from from their perspective, these urban youth lived a good life. Why do they have to come to our country, you know, to to suffer this? So they they really think that they felt for them, you know. So they really took care of them. Um, they're, they're really good people. And nowadays, you know, very sadly, a lot of that values um, or traditional traditional value is gone because people are forced to accept the communist ideology. So inevitably, people just only look out for themselves. Um, and the, with internet and, and TV, you know, the, the, the harm that the propaganda has done on people um, is even greater. So, so I like just to say um, he's very practical. Um, he is risk averse, uh, but I think he will engage in a, in a bitter factional war with his political enemy internally um, for as long as he, he, he can. Uh, I think the only way we could help him to, to come to his senses, to stop that dangerous path, um, is um, really help him have a new perspective on his childhood um, during Cultural Revolution. Really help him put a, understand, you know, who was really helping him, why these peasants helped him. Like I said, it was the Chinese value, Chinese culture. That's the opposite of communist ideology that saved him. If those peasants think exactly like the urban youth or think exactly like the CCP, they would not help him at all. You know, so so if he could if he could have a new perspective on his on, on his um, on his early life, I think maybe that's the biggest help um, the heads of state can give him. Um, I don't know who else he talks to, but uh, Dr. Swati did suggest that when Biden meets him, he should talk about his life in Yan. So that ends my presentation. I know it's a lot of the videos and a lot of slides. Um, do I have a, do I have a, another slides that I prepared? No, I think that's it. So I hope this is, this doesn't bore you because it's a lot, a lot of Xi Jinping talking. I hope this is helpful. Let me see if people have questions for me. Um, Dr. Sir Humphrey, thanks Lay for another interesting live stream. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, travel with love. Thank you, outstanding insight sharing and happy Tuesday. Well, thank you. Um, let me see if people have any questions for me. I oh, I provided the uh, I provided the two links in my description. One is the link to Dr. Swardy's talk. It's one hour long. It's pretty long. Um, and the other is the link to the original Xi Jinping video, interview video. That's very long. I mean, much longer than what I presented, but I collected, I think, the most interesting part. All right. Um, okay, here I have a question from Chris Wilson. I've always loved you're not taking sides, Lei. We think you know the whole story, but did I mention your English is very good? Uh, well, thank you. I made a grandma mistake today. I said... Um, the thumbnail was had had a had a, a gram, grandma era. I said uh, Xi Jinping's beliefs and characters, and when I when I saw it, I'm like, 
it doesn't sound right. It should be character. And then somebody was kind enough to leave me a note. So I had a last, I already, you know, re, uh, set up the video, but I had to change, had the, had to change the, um, uh, the thumbnail, but I'm still learning. Um, thank you very much. I try to be objective because that's the only way to understand what the CCP is up to. Thank you. Um, uh, Lei, how how you get admission in U.S. university? How did I, how did I get admitted to U.S. admission? That's a while ago when there weren't that many Chinese students. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, maybe it was in the early days and there was no competition. I wasn't that good of a student, you know, academic wise, but somehow in China, I didn't do very well. Um, but I think I did quite well here. Uh, my parents always said, um, my parents always said that I shouldn't worry too much when I didn't, when I wasn't doing so well academically in China because they believed the system did not uh, suit me. So they said that you would do much better when you when you go to the United States. And that was exactly what happened. Uh, from Alex Payne, I feel your thoughts are right, but the rise of his life makes things difficult. I'm concerned that China is about to become very turbulent. Let's pray this will not happen. I think China is will become very turbulent. I agree with that. But I think the problem was, you know, like why Xi Jinping believes in common prosperity, why he's not afraid of economic decline, why he believes in building those communal, what do you call that, um, canteen, right, the public canteens. Like he's bringing, um, he's bringing Chinese society backwards. It's all because, you know, like his, his life during those seven years in here and in his mind that was his biggest success like he he felt that if he could pull himself through that seven years and did so well he think anyone could and in his mind that was really a happy time for him um so 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 that has i think has a huge impact on him and that's why he's not afraid of going back to the Mao era. Does he really personally like Mao? I don't think so, because Mao persecuted his father, right? But in his mind, those seven years in Yan'an, that's the type of life he lived. And that's his, like, in his mind, his ideal. And, and he's trying, he's not afraid to go back to that. Um, and that, I, I hope that kind of explains why he's pushing for those um policies that sounds like you know that sounds like they're coming from the 60s or or 70s or even 50s um so your parents sound lovely i like their style uh well they got into trouble for their for their understanding um during the cultural revolution Okay, so let me see. What, yeah, are people, can people change? But not the same question. If you grew up with it, I think it, okay, I'm not sure if that question is for me. Um, from SL, I've been following Hu Xinyu case after your presentation. I formed the analysis that zero COVID policy was pursued to protect the senior elite cadre who are organ recipients. Yeah, that could be. Zero COVID, you know, obviously people have been dying in China. But there was no way that China had so few cases as the government stated. There were cases. You're right, excuse me. You know, so zero COVID was ex executed for a reason. You, you may be right, to protect the senior leaders. Um Will she ever let Taiwan stay independent? Um, involuntarily, you know, maybe he will, you know, like I said, he's risk averse. Maybe if the United States make him feel that he could never win the war or he uh, is unlikely to, or make him, you know, have apprehension, you know, when thinking about launching a war, maybe he would just, you know, keep the status quo.
some poor peasants are still nostalgic for the Cultural Revolution days. It's true, but it's sad because that means their life now is worse than during the Cultural Revolution. So, what does that mean? What does that mean to the Chinese economy? So, does does has China really become the second largest economy、um, if the peasants, you know, in the rural area are still so poor? I mean. In in terms of absolute value, of course they make more money now, right? They have better life. They have probably TV at home.、Um, they have electricity. They have some kind of a、um, um, stove that does not require them to go go to the mountain and and and、um, and, and carry firewoods. But in term in terms of their、um, relative wealth to the rest of the country, the poor now. And in terms of their happiness, their their、uh, confidence about the future, it's definitely worse. So that's why they're, you know, that's why they miss the old, the good old days.、Um, it's it's that just give you a reality check of where the China, where China's economy is today. From oh, I can't pronounce this name, but I but I thank you for the super super chat question. That okay. Anyways, it is my impression that the average Chinese guy has been has been trained by the CCP to hate me as an American guy for many years and never gets to hear a contrary opinion. Thoughts? Um, Chinese. You know, it's true and it's not so true because there are two opposite views, right? So on one hand. The propaganda tells people to hate America, or they think you know, they think it, it creates propaganda to make Chinese believe that America is interested in taking you know taking down China, or you know、uh, that America sees China as an enemy. And so, but then on the other hand, people want love anything American, right? So because people. Are smart. They figure out well. All these high-ranking officials are sending their kids to America, and any wealthy people send their kids to America. If it's not good, then why do these wealthy people go? So, so either you hate it or you love it. This is not. It's that's communist ideology. Common communist thinking is all about extremism. You know, it's like it's it's either one extreme or another extreme.、Um, It's it's although Chinese culture is all about middle of the road approach, right? Not too far left, not too far right. <laughs> you know, I stay in the middle. It's the safest. It's actually, if you think about,、uh, if you think about a circle, the only point that will always stand is the center. Like if you stand on any other spot, you could tip, right? If you think about a circle, but the center is the most balanced, and so that's why Chinese、uh, try to avoid. Any extreme views or trying to avoid do anything extreme, they think being in the center、um, is the most harmonious. But CCP is the opposite; it's the opposite of traditional Chinese beliefs. So you will see Chinese. To get back to your question, you will see Chinese who either love you、uh, or look up to you. Think Americans have a lot of money. You know, is very power is a very powerful country. They look up to you. They want to come here, or they think. You know, or they regard you as enemy because of their,、um, the, because of the propaganda. So it's the two extreme views. There are people who have, you know, objective views, but there aren't. There aren't the majority. Thank you, Bob.、Um, so S W Lai at near at nearly seventy years, she is unlikely to.、Uh, where did that question go? Um, okay, here it is. He's unlikely to change his thinking. Instead, he may feel his time is getting short to realize his life's mission. So he may change to be risk seeking to attack Taiwan soonest. That's a that's a thinking. I'm I'm open to any you know any thoughts. I think that's a very sound. Um, that's that's a very sound um logic. It has yeah it has good logic. 
Yep, I, I would agree with that. But I think with, it's very complex when you, I, I read today, um, I think it came from the Pentagon, somebody, a deputy, I don't know, deputy director or someone from the Pentagon said that Xi Jinping has not made up his mind about Taiwan. And when I read that, I think it's true. I think he has not made up his mind. You know, uh, <laughs> I think that's more than 50%. Um, yeah. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Yuming. Great analysis. All right. Um, uh, from Matt, M A T, Chinese in general do not hate America. They're just a very ethnocentric. That's cultural. I have met many Chinese in college that hold this belief. Yeah. I don't know about that. The other past leaders have lived pretty long. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. So, so is the scare the Chinese will think on their own and not part of the commun community? Uh, is the reason why it's a detest for America? Uh, it's very sad when when you are subject to brainwashing for so long. You 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 get scared when you develop your own thoughts. Um, you're afraid, even, even when you have your own thoughts, you're afraid to express it. So Chinese, um, I don't know if you notice this, people from mainland China, especially the ones that uh, just left China, they have a hard time to really um, express themselves ra rationally and calmly. And even when they do express themselves, it comes with the emotion or with sarcasm. Uh, with some kind of twisted emotions mixed with it, mixed in it, uh, it's because they they have been not they have not been allowed to express themselves, uh, you know, truthfully and honestly and peacefully. So unless you've you know lived here long enough, you understand how um, people in other parts of the world communicate. Uh, it's very hard for them to give up that 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 thinking or habit. Um, you see that I, I see a lot of Chinese, you know, anti-CCP Chinese who are active on social media platforms like Twitter. And, you know, what they put, what they talk about amongst themselves is, you know, uh, anti-CCP <laughs> stuff, but then they get very emotional talking about it and they could be attacking each other. It's sometimes hard to carry a rational conversation with them. And I don't, I don't blame them because I understand they, that's where they're coming from. They have been programmed to, to talk and to think and to communicate that way. All right. So uh, at age 15, he went to village for seven years. So where did he get his education? Where did he study for his degree? That's a that's a very good question. People say uh, Xi Jinping is not very well educated. If you think about it, Cultural Revolution started when he was, what, 13 years old? So there was no school. I mean, even if there was school, you know, the, the, the teacher didn't teach anything. There weren't. So from 13 to, what, 20, uh, 20 22, 23, uh, he, he, there was no schooling for him. So when he went to Tsinghua University, he stud, what, studied what chemical engineering. Um, the people wonder how much he, that was still um, the school, the Gunungbing Dashue. So it was a, the college was only offered to peasant students, to uh, military students. So, so it was not a normal college curriculum that he went through. So if you really look at yeah, that whole generation, not just him, people um, in his age group all went through that. So, yeah. And from Silas Larson, is sarcasm prevalent in the PRC versus traditionally? It is very prevalent. Oh, my goodness. I um, Because people cannot talk honestly, they just twist and turn. And then so they come up with all kinds of jargons and twisted expression to make fun of each other. Um, 
you know, the difference between Chinese humor and the, the Western humor is, you know, Western, you know, Westerners, they make fun of themselves, right? The best humor is when you make fun of yourselves, yourself. And then, but the Chinese make fun of others. So, and it's just, that becomes sarcasm. And it's sometimes it's hard to take. Yeah. Watch Chinese comedy. It's only sarcasm. And it's very, it, 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 sometimes it could be very hurtful. Yeah. The real Chinese humor, um, I think, is, is lost. You know, the real Chinese sense of humor uh, is lost. It's not, it's absent in today's China. So maybe it's still in Taiwan. All right. So while I have talked for quite, quite some time, for over an hour, um, I thank everyone for joining me and um, enjoy the rest of the evening. I'll see you sometime later. Okay, bye-bye.